Hi everyone, my name is Eric Choi and I'm a Physiology and Neurobiology and Economics double major. I was fortunate enough to be selected as a 2020 Holster Scholar and I spent this summer investigating the roles of hormones and heterotopic ossification or the growth of bone in non-skeletal tissues under the faculty mentorship of Dr. David Goldhammer of the Molecular and Cell Biology. I've always had a fascination with stem cells and with bone and muscular regeneration. I'm hearing about it with professional athletes trying these novel new treatments. Um, and with Dr. Goldhammer, I was able to pursue these interests um, through research. On the right, you can see an image of a computer-generated um, pelvis and femur. Uh, the white arrows are pointing at uh, spots of uh, heterotopic ossification. Um, as you can see, they do appear as bone, just as the pelvis and femur do. Uh, so before the COVID-19 pandemic, I was planning on conducting a research experiment in Dr. David Goldhammer's lab, in which I was planning to manipulate the levels of estrogen and testosterone in um, a knock-in mouse model called ACVR1R206H. These mice effectively mimic the human disease of fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP for short. Um, FOP is an extremely deadly form of heterotopic ossification, and uh, it is um, one of the most rare, um, but deadly, as I mentioned. Uh, so after we knew that undergraduate research wouldn't be allowed on campus this summer, I met with the Holster Scholars Committee and with Dr. David Goldhammer, uh, and we decided the best use of my time would be to conduct a literature review. A literature review would really allow me to um, sort of immerse myself into the literature further and understand the context of the research I was planning to do. I was also motivated by Dr. Moscardelli's um, idea that Holster scholars immerse themselves in the middle of an academic conversation. I felt that nothing could do this better than a literature review and by reading um, the literature of other experts in the field, I would further understand the knowledge that I would need um, to pursue a research project and uh, get the most out of it in the future. And I hope to, as I mentioned, I hope to apply this knowledge um, in any future experience I might conduct in the Goldhammer lab. So some basic concepts to begin. Um, hormones are the signaling molecules produced by the glands in our body, and the endocrine system uh, is a system in our body that regulates and um, really distributes these hormones. Uh, they're active in all the biological processes that make that allow us to survive and that make us human, um, but they are also very prevalent in the pathways of bone formation. As you can see in figure one, um, a lot of hormones that we might know, such as testosterone and estrogen, uh, are derived from cholesterol, which is a steroid structure. And something that uh, the Holster Committee and I talked a lot about was the similarity between hormones and how hormones that are seemingly so different might not actually be so different at all. And so it's really interesting to see how these um, seemingly dissimilar hormones um, affect uh, bone formation. Heterotopic ossification, as I mentioned before, is the abnormal growth of bone in non-skeletal tissues. Osteogenesis is the formation of bone. And fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, is an extremely deadly and rare form of heterotopic ossification, as I mentioned before as well. Uh, so while my original research project was investigating the role of sex hormones, testosterone, and estrogen, I decided to uh, expand my horizons and look at non-sex hormones. Leptin is a common hormone found in our bodies, uh, secreted by adipocytes, or fat cells. Um, and in a study by Stepan and colleagues, um, in which they administered uh, leptin into OBOB uh, homozygous mice, which uh, are, hom are homozygous for the trait of obesity, as you can see in this figure. Um, they found that mice administered with leptin uh, had an increase in total body bone area, bone mineral content, and femoral length. You can see in figure two here, um, a comparison between a lean and obese uh, four-week-old mouse. And you can see the comparison between the vehicle, which is the control group, and the leptin-treated group uh, in terms of their total body bone area. So leptin is um, an extremely promising hormone that could um, have an effect on the bone formation within mice. Another non-sex hormone that I looked into was melatonin. I'm sure many of us have heard of melatonin and many of us might have used uh, it before to go to sleep at night. 
It's a hormone secreted by, by the pineal gland in response to the light-dark cycle, and it helps regulate our circadian rhythm in the body. Uh, Suzuki and Hattori use the scales of goldfish, which um, exhibit uh, osteoblastic and osteoclastic characters very similar to human bone cells. Osteoblasts are the cells that build bone, and osteoclasts are the cells that sort of break down bone. So they work in antagonistic um, mechanisms and oppose each other. Um, so in this study of goldfish scales, they found that uh, when you treat the goldfish scales with melatonin, um, they may suppress the differentiation of the osteoclasts and osteoblasts. They did this by attaching, um, or sorry, by examining a protein called TRACP or tartate resistance acid phosphatase, which tracks the levels of osteoclasts and it serves as a marker for osteoclasts. And as you can see here, as concentration of melatonin increased in a six hour incubation period, um, the level of TRACP, again, a marker for osteoclasts decreased. They also did this um, with a marker for osteoblasts, alkaline phosphatase, and found similar results in increasing the concentration of melatonin, um, decreased the differentiation of osteoblasts. So moving from hormones, um, I also looked a lot into the pathways that affect uh, bone development in the body. Uh, Wang and colleagues found that heterotopic ossification progression was halted when a transforming growth factor beta neutralizing antibody was introduced. Uh, the transforming growth factor beta pathway is a uh, signaling pathway that is heavily involved in uh, bone development. Um, as pictured on the right, one of the major transducers in this, pass, uh, in this pathway is the SMAD proteins, and one of them in particular, SMAD3, was found by Matsuda and colleagues. Um, they found when combining the uh, trans when combining the transform, uh, transforming growth factor beta and estrogen receptor signaling uh, pathways in human kidney carcinoma cells, they found that the estrogen receptor actually suppressed the uh, SMAT3 activity, again, um, a transducer in this pathway. They also found something called crosstalk between the estrogen receptor and the transforming growth factor beta. Crosstalk is essentially interference between the two pathways, um, and so neither pathway uh, works out uh, as uh, originally intended and so it is possible that es the estrogen receptor and the transforming growth factor beta pathways uh, affect each other and so estrogen may have an impact on this transforming growth factor beta pathway. Another really important pathway that I looked into was vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF. Uh, VEGF is an important regulator in bone growth and especially angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels. Angiogenesis is extremely important in the formation of bone, as you can see in figure six, because angiogenesis, um, by providing those new blood vessels, it is able to provide the bone cells with nutrients and the oxygen it needs to fully form into the bone um, that is functional. And in a study by Bogan and Degani, they looked at MCF7 breast cancer tissue cells um, in, in which they treated with uh, tamoxifen, which is an estrogen inhibitor. And when treated with tamoxifen, they found that the levels of VEGF mRNAs, as shown in figure seven, um, were actually uh, increased. And this may be promising because uh, uh, tamoxifen, as I mentioned, is an estrogen inhibitor. So the converse effect of having extra estrogen may potentially um, suppress the levels of VEGF mRNA, which would have promising um, indications for regulating bone growth um, and osteogenesis. So in the future, um, I plan to continue this research in heterotopic ossification and fiber dysplasia of significant progressiva in Dr. Goldhammer's lab uh, on the Storrs campus. And hopefully I'll be able to conduct my original experiment planned before COVID-19. I'm hoping to do this either this semester or next semester. And something that I plan to do is sort of take into account all this new information that I've learned and incorporate that into my original experiment. So I anticipate that my original, uh, my original experiment will be slightly modified um, to account for all this new knowledge. And lastly, I hope to continue to apply this knowledge that I've learned 
and to any future experiments that I may be a part of or that I might conduct by myself in Dr. Goldhammer's lab. I'd like to give a big thank you to Dr. David Goldhammer, who was my faculty mentor. Dr. Goldhammer really took me under his wing and showed me the ins and outs of research. I mean, it was, showed a lot of patience and commitment to me throughout this entire process. I'd also like to thank Lori Apuzo, who is a PhD student in Dr. Goldhammer's lab. Lori uh, really worked with me um, closely when Dr. Goldhammer wasn't able to, and she helped me find literature and really pointed me in the right direction in terms of the process of conducting a literature review. I'd like to thank Dr. Moscardelli, who has been there for us since this time last year in the fall. Uh, he has done everything from bringing us donuts in class to organizing this amazing symposium. Um, so thank you, Dr. Moscardelli, for all the work you've done. I'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Holster Scholar, as well as the Holster Scholars Program, uh, for their philanthropic efforts, uh, and they've allowed us to really relish this opportunity um, through the generous funding and program. I'd like to thank the Honors Program for supporting such an amazing program, and I hope that they continue to do so for many more years. And lastly, I'd like to thank my fellow Holster Scholars. Um, it's been so much fun to work and develop these ideas alongside everyone, and I'm really excited that I was able to meet everyone uh, in the Holster Scholars cohort and I'm really excited to see what everyone else has to present. All right, I'm gonna, that's it.